Preciados amigos y amigas, que alegría que estemos todos juntos aquí en la Iglesia de Todos los Santos. Dear friends, what a joy it is that we are all here together uh, this morning at All Saints Church. Uh, mi nombre es Mike Kinman. My name is Mike Kinman, soy rector. I am director. Mi pronombre son él. My pronouns uh, are he, him. Uh, lots, as always, happening. We are still uh, virtual, as you can tell. We're worshiping and we're talking and we're gathering community online. Uh, we are hoping that that is going to be changing uh, mm -hmm. in the not too distant future. And uh, in the meantime, the church is still open and we have lots of wonderful things going on. In fact, part of that is our Sunday uh, food table. This morning, thank you so much to Erica, Gail, Bob and Corazon who are out here, gave away uh, 55 lunches and more than 100 masks. Uh, and so deeply grateful for them and for that ministry. When this pandemic started, we began each week to support some of the local organizations with which we have strong ties uh, as our partners in love. And so every week we name one partner in love that we can ask everyone to just chip in and support because we want to ensure their good work continues during these challenging times. Um, our partner in love this morning is one of our wonderful faith community partners, Icar. Uh, ICAR was founded in 2004 as, I love this, a laboratory for bold, imaginative Jewish practice and to integrate the quest for spiritual nourishment and personal meaning with the mandate to engage courageously, prophetically in social change and justice work. It is one of the fastest growing and most dynamic justice or oriented Jewish communities in the US and a wonderful ministry partner of All Saints Church. So right now, we ask that you just go to uh, ikar.org, I-K-A-R.org, click on donate and make a gift to our partner in love to support this amazing community. Um, and that is a great transition to this morning's forum because our forum guest this morning is the founder and senior rabbi of Ikar, Rabbi Sharon Brous. Uh, Rabbi Brous is a leading voice in reanimating religious life in America, working to develop a spiritual roadmap for a soulful, justice-driven, multi-faith ethos in Los Angeles and across the country. She is a dear friend of All Saints Church, and Rabbi Brous, we are thrilled to have you back here at All Saints Church virtually and looking forward to when we can be together uh, in person. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's such a joy to be with you. Um, especially in these times. But as you know, um, Pastor Mike Kinman, um, many of my formative moments as a rabbi and as a faith leader actually happened in All Saints Church. So I feel so blessed by this friendship and, and the relationship between our communities. And I'm, I'm really grateful to all of you for being, uh, for being with us this morning. Well, and, and thank you so much. And really, I just, I'm, I'm so looking forward to just hanging out for an hour with you uh, and having a conversation. And we also would love for, for you all who are watching to join in. Uh, if you have a question or a way to add to the conversation, uh, here's how you do it. You can text us at 910-TEXT-ASC, 910-TEXT-ASC. That's also 910-839-8272, 839-8272. Do a couple things there. There we go. Um, and uh, Sharon, really, I just kind of want to start with, it's one of these questions that it feels like a simple question. It's usually just a pleasantry. And I know I answer it usually just reflexively. But the more I think of it, it's one of the most complicated questions to answer mm -hmm. with all we've gone through and are still going through. And that's like, how are you doing? Um, and by you, I mean both you personally and your community having gone through uh, and still going through 14 months of this pandemic. Well, um, I, I am, I am exhausted and energized simultaneously. Um, I think what we've gone through in the course of the past month, which I know we'll talk about um, a little bit later on this morning. Um, part of what, what's been so challenging about this recent um, escalation in Israel and Palestine is that it really landed on the open wound of where we all were already mm -hmm. from the past 14, 15 months of pandemic, fear, isolation, uncertainty, um, and heartache, grief, um, which landed on the open wound of the previous four to five years, just experiencing this 
this rapid, deliberate erosion of democracy, full on assault on many of the the values that that so many of us hold dear, um, a, a, a real determined effort to divide the population and turn us um, away from each other. And it, and our, our hearts are hurting, we're hurting. And also I do feel, um, I feel hopeful, if not optimistic, then at least, at least hopeful, um, which is, you know, where a faith leader kind of needs to land, I think, um, because I think that we are living through an era of great moral awakening in this time. We're seeing things that couldn't be seen by many people before. And, uh, and I, I know that I spent, and, and probably you can relate to this um, from your own pulpit, but I think that I spent the first, I don't know, 15 years or so of my pulpit fighting against indifference, really trying to wake people up. And we're awake now. People are awake and, um, and we're very aware of our own vulnerability, of the fierce urgency of now, of the extraordinary nature of the challenges of our time. And there's something very hopeful about that. It's painful um, and challenging. And it's also, we're moving, we're not static. Um, and, and I think that there's a possibility for a kind of transformed society in this time that um, that I, I don't I don't think that I saw in quite the same way even a few years ago. So I'll talk a little bit more about this this morning in our sermon, in, in, you know, later mm. today. But I think that th this is a time for grieving, but it's also a time for dreaming about what comes next, and and then for helping to usher that into the world. Yeah, I it, I really appreciate the language you use about there being open wounds. Um, the experience I'm having is that. That's such a great term because it's not like there are even necessarily new wounds, um, but they're open in a new way, uh, and and maybe we're recognizing them and seeing them, uh, uh, and and maybe there you know those of us especially who have been somehow able to wall ourselves off from them both in ourselves and in others, and I, I, I you know it makes me think that those two things that you mentioned sort of this a time of open wounds and a time of moral awakening. Mm -hmm. um, go together. And I, you know, one of the things that, that, that I'm wrestling with, that we're wrestling with here is, and, and this may be something you want to wait till later and talk about in, in, in your sermon, but as we, as we go look at going back together and coming back together in person, um, the deep desire to recapture what we have lost mm. um, can it could actually make us miss the opportunity for what can be gained mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and trying to hold that balance between yes as a community we do need some of the familiar that we have missed um, and what new voices are we hearing that what new wounds are we experiencing can we be a part of this moral awakening how mm -hmm. how are you all holding that tension at ikar so I, this is exactly what I'd like to speak about later this morning. So okay, I'll give great. you, I'll, I'll, I'll save the, yeah. the kind of analysis and framework for later. Mm -hmm. But um, but we started gathering again at ICAR last month um, in, in May, and we're doing it in small groups. So we have only a, a small number of people who they have to pre-register until the county changes the guidelines, which hopefully will come in the next couple of weeks. As a result, um, we, I mean, so we have, we started with 50. Now, I think yesterday we were up to 85 people. We're meeting, uh, we're meeting outside distanced and masked and pre-registered. And so every part of this, of course, goes against the, it's very counter instinctual, especially for Jews. Yeah. Like we show up at the last minute and 40 minutes late. So, right. um, so we're kind of already countering the, you know, the trend, but we're interestingly, I hadn't really thought about this until you asked like that, but we're meeting outside right now. We're meeting on the rooftop. We have a kind of grassy rooftop in the building where we where we pray. And um, and it's so interesting because it's really different. It, if the prayer feels different. Mm -hmm. And I love that we're coming back together in a, in a very different way than where, how we left. Like people aren't sitting in the same seats that they were in before because that room's not available to us right now until they tell us it's safe for us to go back into that space. But what it's doing is it's really forcing us to not just revert to what was before, but instead to think about what could be. And I, in the early days of the pandemic, I started to, nobody, we didn't have a language for really talking about what was happening. And I started to talk about the world as it was 
which was the pre-COVID times and the world as it could be, which is the post-COVID times, which, which was my way of saying, we don't ever want to go back. And so much has been revealed to us in this time that many people couldn't really couldn't see before. And you can't see it as Arundhati Roy says, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. And in some ways, the most dangerous thing is for us to go back to our favorite restaurants and back to church and back to shul and and get back into our and, and the gym and get back into the rhythm and, and and risk forgetting some of what we've learned during this time of profound vulnerability and awakening. So I love that we're outside right now mm -hmm. because it's just different. It's awkward. The wind comes and the tent is shaking and it's noisy and it's it's chilly. It's hot. It's it's just different. And every piece of the difference is contributing to the sense of we're not going back. And even when we're back in the in the in the seats that we're used to, we're not the same people we were. And so we're going to the work is now in us. We have to manifest that in a, in a very different way than we did before. It's a really yeah. interesting challenge. Yeah, I, I remember when we were starting just getting into the pandemic in, in April, our, our vestry met and we were start, and we didn't think it was going to last. Well, actually, some people thought it was going to last this long and they were pretty prescient. Um, but one of the things that um, I noticed and I and actually played some uh, of this video for our vestry um, about, wow, it's close to five years ago. It's five years ago this month, maybe even be five years ago today, that um, that I was announced as the new rector of All Saints Church. And there was a forum and they sort of like, no one knew who I was. And the members of the search committee sort of went one by one and said, this is why we called this person. And these are our hopes and dreams for the leadership. And really, of course, what that was, that had nothing to do with me. That's the community's hope for the community. Um, you know, because we really didn't know each other yet. It's like dating, you sort of know each other, and then you get married and you really get to know each other. And, you know, part of what uh, the people on the search committee said is, is like, we're really looking forward to getting out of the church and into the street. Hmm. And it, the conversation we had at Vestry, I played that back and I said, that's not about me doing anything. That's about a desire of this community. Well, guess what? We're out of our church right now. Mm -hmm. And, and, like, why are we so anxious to get back? Um, you know, we're actually where we said we wanted to be. And, and so that's mm. like, I love this image of sort of being outside, you know, you're gathering together, but you're in this new way and the wind is whipping around. Uh, and and it's just like, I keep thinking about how can we, how can we re-inhabit the space without going back yes. and maybe view the space in a different way. And maybe just like, is there a way to turn our spaces inside out? Mm. Um, so that the, you know, so it's not just us sort of huddled in our spaces that we love, but that, you know, the, you know, they become like the walls become like these semi-permeable membranes, yes. um, uh, that the community, like the wider community flows in and out of. It's so interesting. I love that. I'm in, in what you're saying makes me think about the chuppah, which you, yeah. know, you said a Jewish wedding. Oh, wow. yeah. And so it's four poles and a, and a cover on top, like the tent that we're praying in right now. <laughs> And of course, talking to you, Mike, is what helps me understand my own my own uh, Jewish reentry into prayer space and the Jewish wedding rituals better, um, which is classic All Saints, forcing me to reconcile or inviting me to reconcile with and 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 uh, engage my own tradition more deeply. But the chuppah is designed to be like the tent of Abraham and Sarah that was open on all sides so that they could see anybody who came by and welcome them into their home. And so the idea is that we take a couple that is sharing their love and, and affirming their love, and we put them in the same place. And we say the, ho the home that you build together is not just about the two of you, but it's about the transformative impact that your love will have on the world. And so it has to be open on all sides so that that love can reverberate out and can have this kind of broader impact on, on the world. And, um, and, you know, it's interesting because I'm sure you've had this with all saints and we certainly had this with Ikar, but being forced to be out of the, I mean, we, do, we do pray in a high school gym. We don't have right. yet a beautiful, yeah. you know, home base like you do. Um, although I love this, it's a beautiful high school gym, but it is a yeah. high school gym. So, and we're in the process of building and, and uh, our own, our own space. But I love that there's something very raw and put together about this, but but we couldn't be in that space. So what happened was we essentially had to move into a kind of um, 
a, a symbolic tent, uh, like really open on all sides. We're all in our own homes. We're all, you know, we're, we're totally connected through the technology, but we're disconnected physically. And what happened is really the walls of the tent got blown open in the most beautiful way. And there are people from Chile and London and Japan and Tel Aviv and Spain and they're they're part of our community now because we weren't locked into this phys the physicality of the space and so like we can now we actually have this reverberative effect um that that really was much harder before because we were focused even though we knew that there were people who could hear and engage um from afar after the fact now there's a community of people who are live from around the world who are with us and i suspect it's the same thing at all yeah, saints we, we have people like on from five continents like any given sunday it's amazing and like all over the country oh my god there's something so powerful about that yeah. it's really challenged our notion of what of what interconnectivity looks like yeah. and i mean we really preach a torah of interconnectedness which is so much a, it's a it's a reaction to the culture of radical individualism i you know i take care of myself <clears throat> and my immediate and instead we we try to really understand how how profoundly connected we are to one another and i i always think about the aspen trees do you know those trees and oh mike you're gonna love this so much oh, good. I so I, I go to a conference um, in Park City, Utah every year, mm -hmm. and there's a Jewish conference there. So we like quadruple the number of Jews in Utah, <laughs> you know, for, for a long weekend <laughs> once a year. And um, and so but they have all around uh, all in Park City, they have these beautiful aspen trees. They're these like tall, beautiful, elegant white tree trunks, and they look like they're all individual trees but the aspen trees are actually connected beneath the surface by this right. invisible web and it's actually one living organism from utah to colorado and and the you know at least the some maybe there's an arborist on your uh, uh, you know on with us right now who who will correct me if i'm wrong but what i was taught about these trees is that it's it's the largest living organism and when one tree goes down even in colorado mm -hmm. another tree will be born somewhere else in the organism that kind of compensates and and when i when i c kind of came into the mythology of the aspen of, of these trees i realized that it's just like us yeah. like we think we perceive ourselves to be separate and apart from one another but we're so profoundly connected and when one is in pain that it's felt by the whole body and when one mm -hmm. is able to celebrate it's felt by the whole body and so mm -hmm. how do we remind ourselves of that when we live in these kind of isolated boxes and in some way moving out of the church and out of the gym right putting us into greater isolation, because I was projecting services from this very spot for the last right. year and a half. But in some ways that actually tore down the walls and helped us realize just how connected we are so that the family in Chile is actually a member of ICAR now right. and wouldn't have been otherwise. And then how many continents? Eight continents? Yeah, I mean, we have like five every Sunday pretty much. Five and continents. It just is, it's, and then now we, and, and we get to wrestle with now, what does this mean for our community? incredible um and and it just is like we've had people in newcomers classes who live hours you know like on the other side of the country and and so what can you know what what does this mean for us as a community um and how do we this is like it's not just how do we not leave people behind um mm -hmm. how do we embrace the incredible gift of this by the uh, way that reminds me of one of my all-time favorite yeah. all saints church stories which is um, Reverend Ed Bacon, a, mm -hmm. a very dear friend of mine, oh, invited yeah. me when I was a young rabbi. We hadn't, we, this was, I mean, he, we, he and I became friends before we even started Ikar. And I do believe that in some ways Ikar is created in Ed Bacon's um, image, in, in oh, Ed Bacon's wonderful. vision and spirit. So, um, but, but one Sunday he invited me when Archbishop Desmond Tutu came to mm -hmm. speak at All Saints. And it was a it was an absolutely transformative experience. And I remember that one of the things that he said, and this was I'm I'm guessing 17 years ago. I mean, we can mm -hmm. we can look it up and find when he was there pretty easily, I imagine. But he said that one of the, he said two things that I remember. One of them um, was that the Holy One seated on the throne of glory is looking out and weeping because as as so many of God's children are suffering in poverty and war and hunger the church is fighting about whether or not two men who love one another can actually wed 
-hmm. And he said, the Holy One is weeping. And that was so, so profound and so right. And the other thing that he said was he said, I really came here because I wanted to say thank you to the good Christians of Pasadena at All Saints Church. He said, in all of those years when Nelson and I were in prison, we would get letters from All Saints Church um, members and they would write to us and tell us to keep our strength and spirits up. And he said, we used to turn to each other and say, one day when we get out of here, we're gonna go to Pasadena and say, thank you. And he <laughs> said, so I'm here to just say thank you. And the reason this, I mean, this is so applicable to this moment is he's also part of your church. And I mean, what that what happened when All Saints members sent letters to Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu in, in prison and Robin's and what they were saying was, you are also a part of this family. We are connected to each other. We're part of the same grand living organism that is right. that is, you know, human beings. And and we have to see each other, which I think is so much at the heart of of both what's broken in our society, our inability to see one another. And that's where the promise lies for all of us in really building a just and loving society. Can we actually see each other as part of the same human family? Mm. Yeah, and yeah, and I th actually think that when you talk about the, I don't know if it's the same thing when you talk about the aspen trees. Uh, I know Ed was really involved. It's something that sounds like this maybe the same thing called pando, yes. which is this sort of the, like the largest living organism, and it just is, um, and it really is like creation. This is the song of creation, yeah. um, and if we would just listen to the song of creation. Uh, mm -hmm. instead of continually trying to fight against it. I mean, and, and of course, the great thing about that is that's where the largest gravitational pull is. Uh, it is towards this, you know, universal unity. Um, I, you know, part of, part of what I've been thinking about, actually, I was having a conversation in my family yesterday is, and about this pandemic, and it really kind of relates to this, is I was reading this piece that said, you know, this is probably the first globally shared event in human history mm. um, because you know you, you know tiny indigenous villages in mm -hmm. far-flung parts of lands are still touched by this and even little islands that have said we're just going to shut ourselves off even by doing that first of all they're economically touched by this but even by having to take that active shut themselves off um, they're touched by this and and to say that there isn't there, there isn't a person or a society or, or a village or, or community that has not in some way been touched by this pandemic. Um, and, and I wonder if one of the things that, that we've sort of touched on a little bit um, is, is grief. Um, and I know I, I'm grieving a lot of different things. We've lost people that we love. Um, we've lost sort of a sense of unshakability of the way things were. And I think I'm also sort of feeling some preemptory grief because as we come back together in person, I know that Part of me is expecting things to be like they were, and there's no way they can be. And part of that is that there's some people who were here when we left who will not be here when we gather. I, I'm, I wonder both sort of how, how are you wrestling with grief personally and as a community? And also, is there a way that we can come together as a planet? Um, with a shared experience of grief, if we can be vulnerable enough uh, to own that this is our common wound right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, I think we saw in such dramatic fashion just how connected we are. The way that this, I mean, if you look at the map of the spread of the virus, um, and you're right that nobody was left untouched. And I do remember some wise person said, and I know it was attributed to many wise people, but <laughs> we don't know who actually said it, but somebody said pretty early on, we're all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. Right. And I think that's also really important to remember. Everybody mm -hmm. was touched by this, but yeah. obviously as always the poor, and black and brown communities and marginalized communities were affected so differently from this. Um, and, and that's also part of the reckoning that's ha that has to happen right now. But I, and, and the, the grieving is part of what I'm gonna speak about later this morning. Part of what I was searching for through this time was a kind of um, a, a, a map. I wanted a blueprint of how to hold a time that turns our world upside down 
how do you hold such profound loss? And it's not just, it, I mean, it is, it's literally the death of people we love. Um, and it's one of the things that, you know, will, that you will see when you reopen and that we're already seeing um, as we've done this slow reopen, but there, you know, the people who aren't there and won't be there um, because yeah. they've died during this time. So it's, it's that loss, but, and, but that's not even, I mean, there's so there, there's that there's that loss there's the the loss of innocence the loss of security the loss of jobs the loss of opportunities the loss of love you know how many relationships ended in this time because they never should have been forced to confront the extreme like the extreme circumstances i mean right. i think some people are saying well it's better they obviously weren't meant to be together if they mm. ended some of them maybe but some yeah. of them like forced to i mean i remember in the very beginning when my husband and I got in an argument because when we, he would open the gate, I would just put the key in and turn the key and he was putting his hand on the gate. And I'm like, that's an unnecessary contact. Like, you, you know, right. God forbid yeah. you're more exposing yourself. And like, there was so much anxiety and fear and uncertainty and pressure yeah. on our relationships. And, and then the loneliness and just like be, people who are, you know, who, who really were alone through this period. And then the people who didn't have a minute alone during this period. <laughs> and, you know, there's so such a toll. We're not okay. Mm -hmm. We're really not okay. And this is goes back to what you were asking earlier, you know, about the danger of just going back to what was. It's not only because the veils lifted, and we now see that what was is not what ought to be. It's also mm -hmm. because we are broken. And if we just try to roll back into life as it was before without addressing those wounds, I, we're, I mean, we're doing, and that's violence against our spiritual systems. And I'm so worried about that. And so could this be an opportunity for like a global grief? I don't know. I think that grieving is done best locally personally. And I, I, I mean, again, I think we're part of the reason we're talking about all of this is because, it, you know, it, it, this is top of mind and I'll say more about it later. But one of the things that we did at Icar um, was we have a memorial service on Yom Kippur. Right. And so we do Yiskor the memorial. It's a time for remembering. And we do it several times throughout the year on holidays. And the biggest one is on Yom Kippur. And so what we've done, so what, it's a service that's dedicated to remembering our loved ones who've died. Um, and it's always powerful. We ask our people to submit memories, stories, um, uh, and photographs of their people. And we compile them into a beautiful book that we put out every year. And then people sit and they'll stay because Yom Kippur is a fast day and it's an all day prayer experience. And people who, many of whom would not ever consider themselves religious Jews who want to stay in synagogue all day. They will stay all day and they'll sit and read these stories and weep. And we share just the beauty of, of the lives that have been lost and, and some of the struggles too, because it's not only lifting people. I, we don't heroize people. It's telling the truth about them. But this year, because we weren't, and then we have, then we have this beautiful service. People are reading the books and the clergy goes around the room and we stop at every single person and they say the names of the people they've lost and we repeat the names back to them and we weep and we hug and it's beautiful. And we couldn't do it this wow. year because High Holy Days, you know, landed in the midst of the pandemic. And so, um, so we were really trying to figure out what to do. And what we came up with was we built a Yiskor Memorial Garden it outside of our the space where we're going to be building our um our building in the next few years and it's this it's on la cienega it's like this crazy busy street but there's mm -hmm. a little garden space and led by rabbi kayla labelle from my team and an incredible group of um volunteers and um amazing people we built this garden um and it was it's a memorial garden with like rock sculptures and and we put up walls and we had photographs the most beautiful photographs and stories of all of our loved ones and there were hundreds of them and people came in a distanced way on their own because remember october was like still we were peak covid mm -hmm. here and they just spent hours walking through and reading each other's stories and just weeping and I realized what we were doing was not what we had ever done before with Yiskor. We were mm -hmm. actually creating a space for public mourning and because it's out on La Cienega and yeah. like anybody could come in. And I think yeah. 
So it's local, but it's out, but the but the the four walls of the chuppah are open. So like yeah. in other words, like there is a tent, but the tent is open. And I think that might be a model for kind of localized memorial yeah. memorials of all that's been lost, the people and the opportunities and the love and the um, and the jobs and the income and the security and all of it, creating localized opportunity for people in a way that feels true to them. Like I think I saw that, I think it was in Detroit where they made these six or eight foot pictures of the people who died from COVID and they lined the streets mm -hmm. with these pictures and people were just driving around and just looking in the faces of the people who we've lost. And I think it's upon each community and even yeah. each city um, or neighborhood to figure out how are we going to hold grief? Grief is the imperative. The particular yeah. way of holding grief, I think is much more localized. Yeah, this is, and this is wonderful. And I actually want to come see that garden because, um, and first of all, it just, it reminds me that, you know, as human beings, we're amazing. We, 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 we know how to do and create what we need. And so we're actually creating something very similar to what you've talked about here at All Saints. And part of the conversation that came out of was, when there's a tragedy like you know, like 9/11 or you know or like you know a police shooting or something like that, there's a geographic center to it. But pandemics don't have geographic centers. Mm -hmm. And when there's a geographic center, people gather there and communities gather and they create um, a memorial there. But where do you do that for a pandemic? Well, we have to provide the space. Um, and so some members of our community got together and they actually had this idea from something that's a, it's a, a Buddhist thing where there's just a, there's a, a, a framework and then there's just wires and people can hang whatever they want to on the wires where uh, the name we came up for it is the through line because it's just mm -hmm. going to be a through line for everything. And so um, in the next week or so, we're going to put this thing up, but we're going to be intentionally putting it up on our property, but right by the sidewalk yeah. so that it becomes a public. It's not like, oh, that's All Saints' thing. It's a public, but it's the, same, it's the same impulse that our communities have had. The other thing this reminds me of is conversations we've been involved with with Janelle Austin, who's the caretaker of the George Floyd Memorial. And what happened at uh, the George Floyd Memorial is they erected, I think, this you know nine foot tall, thirteen foot tall um, black power fist. It started out to be in wood, then they made it in um, in, in steel. Um, and and it became an anchor for the community's expression of of grief and protest. Um, and then when someone else was killed in another part of the city, they took the original wooden one and put it there. And their idea is, and they're working with activists around the country uh, to bring, you know, to say, okay, we're going to, we'll help you construct this thing. You figure out where you want to do it, where you want to put it. It can be an anchor, but what it will do is it will show that these are not isolated events. Yes. That every community will have a chance to create its own grieving space in its own mm -hmm. way. And there will be this common symbol that will link them all together that will show how our grief is connected and our anger is connected. Yes. And, and I, I wonder, like, if, you know, it makes me wonder, like, well, if Ecar is doing this and All Saints is doing this, other people must be doing this. And I would love to just see around the world how our communities, I said, look, because grief is local, how our communities gathering in grief. I, I imagine um, some amazing art is being created. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even, you know, maybe the point is maybe we each do this locally, but then we have a chance somehow to gaze on the incarnations of this mm. um, around the country and around the world. Uh, so I, I want to come out and see that one because I want to, first, I just, I just want to experience that. But it just is, I think it's remarkable that individually our communities came up with, you know, essentially just sort of a very basic human yes. idea, which is how do we provide space to grieve? Right. That's right. Yeah. And by the way, I think so, it's also, I mean, just, I think it's very telling that I think the day before the inauguration that President Biden and Vice yeah. President Harris made a day of grief, of national grieving and, you know, and went out and, and offered prayers and it just, ma it matters. It's, it's just acknowledging how broken we are right now. And it's not going to be one day and it's not going to be one garden. It's going to be over the course of time. There, this grief, um, this grief will help us heal. Yeah. So I uh, want to remind people that you can text in a question, 910-TEXT-ASC, uh, 910-839-8272, 910-TEXT-ASC, 910-839-8272. Um, some of the stuff that, you, that you've been talking about, I just, oh, I just love this, um, uh, sort of goes in, in this direction. I was, um, 
I was hearing you give a talk online a week or two ago, and what caught my ear was the title of the interview, which was Building Beloved Community, which is like we, you know, common, like we use a language all the time, you know, from Josiah, Josiah Royce and W.D. Du Bois, Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King. Um, and you quoted this piece of Dr. King's letter uh, from a Birmingham jail, which is really what we've been talking about. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly uh, affects all indirectly. Um, the, it's got me thinking about events that are happening around the world. And, uh, you know, in terms of the pandemic, we, ha we have a parishioner who is uh, from India and has family in India and has, you know, four family members who are elderly who are living in one house and like literally trying to control from here who gets into that house and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, you know, that, that no longer can be a news story that I'm just sort of reading in the morning. Yes. It's like, no, this is, we're connected through this person. Um, and, and so I want to talk about Israel and Palestine, which, you know, part of, you know, what happened is, is as you and I started talking at the beginning of this, you were telling me about, you know, your family who's there. And I'm hearing from uh, Palestinian, you know, friends who have families there. And this is not something that's disconnected, obviously, from you, but also not from us either. Um, and it, it, it feels to me some potentially hopeful developments this week notwithstanding um that it, it feels as intractable as it's ever been um and when you and i were talking earlier this week you talked about uh complicating the story of israel and palestine which sounded like something that really needs to happen and, and i love the way you phrased this you said where pain problem and power is and what to do about it and so you know i'd, I'd love to just sort of hear from you where is pain problem and power what do we do about it and how can we create a beloved community that includes all of us hmm. well i think the first the first piece of this is it's really i think that this time this era that we're living in which i said earlier i believe is an an era of moral awakening mm -hmm. um it has taught us that the only way that healing is possible and the only way to advance toward a society that's truly just and equitable and loving is to speak honestly about where the pain is and where the problems are. And so, you know, what, what I, I'll, what I talked about yesterday in my sermon at Icar, which you can certainly listen to if you want, mm -hmm. is and what I've been speaking about, you know, for the for the last many years about about Israel and Palestine is in an attempt to speak truthfully about about where the vulnerabilities are and where the obligations are to one another and to our own to our own. And so you know, I, I will just, I'll share with you, I, I told my community yesterday, and I don't think I ever spoke publicly about this before, but um, when I was a child of six or seven years old, I used to say um, the words of Shema before getting into the shower each morning. Mm -hmm. This is a prayer. Um, it's like the central piece of Jewish liturgy, one of the oldest Jewish prayers for, straight from the Torah. and. Um, and I, I, and I had no formal Holocaust education. And certainly at that age, nobody had ever really told me directly, but I heard that Jews said Shema in the before going into the shower because they might not come out alive. Right. Because I must have heard somewhere that like when Jews arrived at Auschwitz, they were told that the gas chambers were showers and many people you know, understood what that meant. So what I was talking about yesterday is the way that trauma and intergenerational trauma, inherited intergenerational trauma, has really shaped the way that we discuss and uh, the, has shaped the discourse on Israel-Palestine. And I understand it because I have it in my body. I carry it also as a Jew. Um, and I, I, really, I, I really do understand it. And I also think it doesn't do us any service because it what it does is it ends up shaping a conversation in which we can't actually speak honestly about what's going on. What, what I believe 
is happening in this time is because of this era of great moral awakening, because of the racial justice uprisings, because the, because the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, one, two, three, like awakened something. It, it, it brought conversations from the margins to the mainstream. It's forced us to acknowledge that truth telling is the only way to move forward. And because of that, what we're now seeing is a very different discourse and 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 my my i mean we can talk from the you know about the the very basic kind of outlines of what this conflict has been and where the vulnerabilities are and where the blame lies we can talk about what different potential political solutions are but the reality is that on one very small sliver of land lives two peoples both of whom have profound vulnerability in the world, both of whom have inherited trauma, and, and both of whom deserve to live in, mm -hmm. in a just and dignified and peaceful society. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a very big power imbalance between, the, between Israelis and Palestinians, and there are all kinds of complicated elements to this uh, narrative, but on the very simple level, no, there are nine million citizens of Israel 20% of them are Palestinian citizens of Israel. There are another couple of million Palestinians who live under Israeli occupation. None of those people are going anywhere. They don't have passports to other countries where, that they can call home. So what we need to figure out is how, how to build a shared future and what that could actually look like. And in this time of, of truth telling, what's happening is at its best. And the reason why one might feel slightly hopeful, um, especially after like some of what's going on with the, this new coalition forming, which hopefully will advance in the, in the course of the next week. And there's still enough time for, for bad actors to, you know, undermine that because there's about another week left before it will be locked in. Um, and bad actors like to undermine things in that region for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but but the reason that I think we can be, if there's a reason for hope, it is this, that what is very clear now to many, many people is that 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 this is the this, this situation on the ground, the status quo is unjust, it is immoral, it is unsustainable, and it's not working for anyone. Mm -hmm. And it has to change. And there is a way to build a different kind of future. And that way is not matching the orthodoxy of the far right with an orthodoxy of a far left that is equally dismissive of the broad center of people who actually just want to get home safely at the end of the day and want to build a shared future. It's not moving to the poles. It's not moving to the extremes. It's actually taking our cues from the tens of thousands of Israeli Jews and Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians uh, in the West Bank who are marching arm in arm every single day for the past month and demanding that they, that they that they together build a different kind of society and standing together in love and in solidarity and in justice and so ultimately that like that's where my inspiration comes from mm -hmm. when i feel like we over here in america we're like this will never be resolved it's a conundrum it's a quagmire and then there are all of these israelis and palestinians who are like we're building it we're building it right now and what we need is your funding and your support and your amplification because guess what the people on the far right are funding and supporting and amplifying their actors on the ground but then we just wring our hands and leave the people who are doing the hard work on the ground to basically be you know flailing in the in the in the wind over there and they're the ones who are actually building the future that that i i think you know the people of that region need and deserve who are some of the voices you say to amplify? Who are some of those powerful voices that, that you're trying to amplify? Well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I have been avoiding social media um, for the last several years. Um, I'm almost never on social media, but I've been going on to looking at Twitter lately, simply for one reason, to follow the people of Omdim Biachad standing together. This is one of many nonprofit organizations, NGO in, in Israel, um, that is made up of, Jew, of of Israelis and Palestinians who are working together for a different future. Look at the work of Combatants for Peace. 
I don't know if you've ever met or heard from Suleiman Khatib. If you haven't, mm -hmm. sorry, if you could, it's it's a little bit loud with the plane. Uh, you got it. Um, Suleiman Khatib is a um, he's a Palestinian from a town called Khizma, oh, just over the um, over the, the the border from Jerusalem, and he when he was 14 years old, he stabbed an Israeli soldier in an attempt to get the soldier's gun. He went to prison for 10 and a half years as a 14 year old child mm -hmm. in Israeli prison. He, you know, he, he basically got his education and it's, it was called revolutionary university, you know, but he also was t totally transformed. And this is a story that, that he tells so beautifully and you should bring him to speak. He, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk mm -hmm. at this church. And he was, he saw a Holocaust documentary when he was in Israeli prison. And it, it was the first time he'd ever seen Jews as victims and Jews as human beings. And it changed him. And he realized that the way to transform the reality, which is an unfair and unjust reality, is not through violence, but it's through nonviolence. And he started to learn the work of Dr. King and Gandhi and others. And he came out and built an organization called Combatants for Peace. We just did an incredible forum with him a couple, um, two mm -hmm. weeks ago during in the midst of all of this violence and he just wrote a new book and so with, with um with a with a partner um panina eilberg schwartz and it's worth reading the book and it's worth bringing him but wonderful. look at combatants for peace look at the parents family for the bereaved families forum and parent circle in fact i met Yitzhak frankenthal who was one of the founders of the um, parent circle at all saints church in the rector's mm. forum years ago and he told me one of the most powerful i mean he gave an incredible talk at all saints probably um, again probably 18 years ago mm -hmm. and his work changed me because i realized like here's an here is an israeli jew whose son arik was murdered by hamas when he was 19 years old i think and um and he's dedicated his life to now building connections with palestinians who've lost their beloved immediate family members. And together they are working to defy the, what has become the growing norm of hatred and division and instead to build a shared future. Those are the people who I look at. And I mean, I just gave you three examples, but there's so many more. So many of the of those that um, organizations that are funded by the New Israel Fund, which is really dedicated to funding democracy and civil society. Um, th these are the people who are actually on the ground building a different kind of future. And so, you know, you can look at what's happening on Wilshire outside of the federal building and mm -hmm. the, the pro this camp fighting the pro that camp. And in reality, like we believe in building a just future for all mm -hmm. of the people who live there, all of whom have inherited trauma that is not only intergenerational and inherited, but also active trauma. Because, and I'm sure you've, I mean, you probably heard even me say this, because I feel like I say this all the time now, but, uh -huh. but for me, I, you know, I heard years ago, Ami Ayalon, who's a former, um, I think he was a general in the, um, in the Israeli um, naval forces and he, I'm mean, sorry, air force. And he, he said, no, in the Navy. And he said during the second intifada, when there was so much death and destruction, and he said, after an attack, when we count our dead, we don't count one, two, three. We count six million one, six million two, six million three, which means everything that happens happens on the context of an already open wound. Like we started by talking about open wounds. And so recognizing and understanding the role of trauma in the in the in the perpetuation of, of an unjust situation. And, and and of unjust policies, it's not to excuse it or justify it. It's to say, if we are going to address this conflict, if, there, if we're going to find a third way, a different way, we must understand the role of trauma, of vulnerability, um, of fear. And it, it just has, to, that has to be at the forefront of our conversation. So I ultimately feel hopeful because I feel like there are people doing this work now and now we understand at, at least the moral awakening of this time has shown us that the status quo let us lay to rest the mythology that that status quo is sustainable mm -hmm. and i think we you know one of the things that bb did that was his great triumph over 12 years of rule as israel's prime minister was as as my friend daniel sokach also a friend of all saints church you know who now runs the new israel fund as he says, you know, Bibi created a bubble 
in which he actually worked for 12 years to help Israelis think that the conflict was very far away and not at mm -hmm. their doorstep. And so a, there, there was a kind of complacency that emerged in many places, a sense that, okay, it's kind of working for us just the way it is. Right. And that was a lie because it's not working and it never worked for millions of Palestinians who are living on the other side of this occupation. And so now the veil is lifted. We all can see, I mean, the violence in the mixed cities, the, 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 this, this explosion of violence, it shows that it's not okay. It hasn't been okay. Things need to change. And can we follow those people who actually are doing the real work of shared society to figure out how together to build a home for millions of, of Israeli Jews and Palestinians who, who call this place their home and literally have nowhere else to go? Oh. Yeah, it's, I, I love how you talk about this. And um, it, you know, I, I wonder, again, this is this is such a shared experience. Um, you know, my experience of Israel and Palestine is so incredibly limited. The one time I was I was there was in uh, May of 2014. And what really struck me at the time, um, and this was a couple months before the Ferguson uprising was when I would sit with uh, young people in the Palestinian refugee camps, the language they used to talk about the IDF was the same language I heard young black men used to talk about the police in St. Louis. And when I would sit with people in the IDF, the language they used was to talk about the refugees was the same language I heard the police use. And the mm. power imbalance was there. And then, you know, in Ferguson, you know, you get tear gas canisters shot at you and it gets tweeted out and people in Palestine are saying, these are the exact same tear gas canisters that are shot at us. Mm. Here's, here's the recipe for eyewash that we used. Um, and you know, I love how you sort of ended that, which is saying, you know, we've created this illusion in this country too, that, that this is working for us, that the power disparity and that the way policing is done in this country um, is working for us. And the truth is it isn't working for anyone. Um, and, and, and we need to adopt a, a, a trauma informed perspective. Um, you know, uh, what, 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 what you're talking about makes me wonder about is, um, just as people working in the movement for black lives in America have found common cause with people working for Palestinian liberation, you know, is there a way that we can start to draw these parallels? I mean, I think about our relationship with, uh, the people indigenous to this land. Um, and, and the history we have there, you know, can we start, uh, and maybe this is part of that great moral awakening that you're talking about. Can we start to discover first principles mm -hmm. for a trauma informed way of living together, uh, that leads to this kind of healing. Hmm. So, you know, I, I want to share with you a, a, what Amos always described as the story mm -hmm. of Zionism, um, mm -hmm. for a moment, I feel like I've, I, I, um, I feel I've been turning to him more now in the last month than uh, than than ever before. But I, I want to offer this because I, I think that there's a great power in recognizing the similarities between the struggle for black lives here in the United States and the Palestinian struggle. And mm -hmm. there's also a lim there are limits to the mapping of one conflict onto another. Right. And so let me just share this because it, I might yeah. might offer an interesting perspective. What Amos Oz tells is the story of um, of a man who's out at sea and the ship is shipwrecked and everybody on board dies. His whole family and his whole community is drowns in the shipwreck. He survives, but he's in the waves and about to be overcome when he sees a plank. And so with every last bit of energy and strength swims to this plank, only once he realizes it, once he gets there, does he see that there's another man who's also holding onto this plank for dear life. Mm -hmm. He pushes the other man over a little bit to make room for him too. And in fact, there is enough room for the two of them on this plank. Amos Oz says he has the right to grab hold of the plank and even to push the other man over a little. What he doesn't have the right to do is push the other man into the sea. Right. And he uses that as his description of the complexity of the state of Israel and the origin story of the mm -hmm. state of Israel which is different 
from other colonial co colonial enterprises and settler mm -hmm. enterprises that we are much more familiar with as Americans. Um, and, and when we look at the history of European colonialism, um, we, we, we hear and we tell a certain story. And then that story is often mapped onto the Israel-Palestine narrative in a way that I think is really unhelpful. And in fact, actually make, in, in some ways renders those who use that narrative um, almost unable to actually be helpful in advancing the, the in, in advancing a just society, mm -hmm. because it makes the, at least many people in the Jewish population feel like we are completely not understood here. This country mm -hmm. was not formed by a bunch of wealthy white European, you know, men saying, mm, blood and, you know, we, like, where can I, where can I um, take from the land and get rich? This was a country built by refugees, a country that was built by uh, people who came from, who either fled during the, the war and were able to make their way in or fled from DP, you know, came from DP camps or mm -hmm. among the 700,000 Jewish refugees from Arab lands who were kicked out of their homes after the establishment of the state, but were part of the early building of the state as well. And so having that narrative um, as part of our thinking as we try to to deal with and, and consider what some of the potential solutions might be or or um, responses might be to the conflict is absolutely essential here. And I also will, will just add that because there's been you know, obviously this resurgent in anti-Semitism that's happened in the around mm -hmm. the country and around the world in the course of the last several uh, several weeks, mm -hmm. um, that it's not it's not a, a vulnerability that comes from an era gone by. That that anti-Semitism is alive and well mm -hmm. in some places in white nationalist circles. It's very much been lifted um, to the surface and even become. I mean, they're, they're, this is what the what those protesters were chanting when they right. were in Charlotte. Yeah, so. Jews will not yeah. replace us, which revealed to us in ways that I think many of us didn't understand the way that anti-Semitism is at the heart of white nationalism. Mm -hmm. And really, at the, I mean, it, in a way that degrades and denigrates both Jews and black people. It's a really mm -hmm. vulgar uh, form of anti-Semitism that that it uses a uh, Jewish conspiracy, Jewish power as a way of excusing or justifying black excellence. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 really disgusting. But there's also an anti-Semitism that's more subterranean, a kind of uninterrogated anti-Semitism that when the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, whenever there are conflagrations, you see this um, anti-Semitism emerging and, and think, oh, that's actually not just about a conflict in a faraway land. That's mm -hmm. about something else that's going on, about a way that Jews are perceived um, that's not so different from the way that white nationalists perceive Jews, meaning holding this conspiracy theory that Jews have all the power, have all the resources, have the money, control the media, etc. So I want to I want to just add that dimension mm -hmm. to this conversation. No, it's helpful. Thank you. And I know that our time is so short here. I just realized what time it is. You said we're not yeah, going to but... believe how fast an hour will go. Yeah, we, we can actually go about seven more minutes. So OK, if you've got a, so. Yeah. But I, I just want to add that to this conversation because um, because there's a way in which um, the uh, the in, in which understanding the um, the the power dynamics between police and uh, and black people in America absolutely helps us understand the power dynamics right. in some ways over there. Right. And also there are limits to that analogy. Because the dynamic is, it, I mean, there are some things are uncomplicated. Military mm -hmm. occupation of uh, of millions of people is uncomplicated. That's just wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not. I, I saw. I saw. Um, the Onion had an it had an interesting um, image the other the other day mm -hmm. that was as usual. The Onion was kind of spot on, but it was an image of a. Palestinian woman who was weeping and her house had been d destroyed to rubble behind her. And it said, Palestinian woman takes great comfort in knowing that it's all very complicated. And it, yeah. so like they kind of nailed it, which is let us not get caught up in it's so complicated. It's so complicated as if to say there's no moral right and wrong. Yeah. And that is true. And also this is not the same as any other um as any other conflict that 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 people tend to map on it and we have to bring a sensitivity and awareness to that otherwise mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to find a way to solve for it because 
in fact, this is a, a conflict between two very vulnerable and very traumatized people. And so that needs to be addressed in yeah. the building of shared society, which is profound. It's precisely why I keep looking to those same Israelis and Palestinians who have found their way to one another through their shared trauma that, uh, that to my mind, help offer us a potential path, uh, pathway out of this. This is so incredibly helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And it, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm almost hesitant, but I'll just go ahead and jump in anyway, because we've only got five minutes left, but who knows, this would be sort of a to be continued. Um, and, and, and it is, and even if you can just sort of tell the story again, because I remember you and I were sitting together in a meeting and you told this amazing story. And I think you just used it in your Rosh Hashanah service uh, sermon. And it was a story from the Talmud about a dispute between rabbis about a beautiful house that was built around, I think it was a stolen beam. Um, and like one rabbi said, you need to tear the beam out and give it back because you can't build something beautiful on a lie. The other rabbi says, you, that's crazy talk. Um, don't destroy this beautiful thing. You got to pay the person from whom the beam was stolen, uh, especially considering how valuable it is now as the foundation of this beautiful house. Um, and, and I wonder like oh, what, what this, even in sort of the distinction, which I think is excellent that you're drawing between what's happening in Israel and Palestine and what's happening in America, um, is, you know, there's a shared trauma that you talk about in Israel and Palestine that may not be true here. Um, can you just sort of talk about, like, well, when do you, when do you tear the beam out? When, mm -hmm. when, when do you need to have revolution and, 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 and say, no, this needs a whole new beam? Um, and when do we say, well, no, what does reparation look like? Um, Great question for four minutes left. But, right, uh, exactly. It's so funny yeah. because I remember the question that Ed asked me when we had four minutes left and it was, Israel, Palestine, what are we gonna do? And I was like, <laughs> really? Because I'm giving a sermon in a couple minutes upstairs. So it's perfect in all in, uh, in, uh, in the spirit of things here. Um, yes, the Mishnah that you cite has become a really central Mishnah for me. So the Mishnah, for those who are unfamiliar, is uh, Code of Jewish Law codified around the year 220 CE. And in this legal code, exactly as your pastor just shared, two rabbis are in a dispute about what happens when you build a beautiful home on a foundation of a stolen beam. In other words, a person goes to their neighbor's property, steals the beam, uses that as the foundation for their home. So what should be done? And exactly as you say, um, Shammai says, you have to tear down the home and give back the stolen thing. And Hillel says, no, that is a beautiful home. And, and, and you do no service to anybody by making the people who live in it homeless now. So instead, just pay reparations. And the reason that he felt that reparation, he doesn't use the word reparations, I do, because I realized that we thought over the years that what, what Hillel and, and Shammai were arguing about is tshuva. It's how do you reconcile after there's a wrong? And, and what he was really talking about was America. And what do you do when you build a country on a stolen beam? And that beam is millions of people who are stolen from Africa and brought to this country to build a house on stolen land. What then do you do? So, it, and, 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 and so here's what I will say. What Hillel does that Shammai doesn't, and Hillel's really a pragmatist, and Hillel almost always wins when the two, these two rabbis <laughs> argue with each other. You've probably heard of many, I mean, there's Hillel on college campuses. There's no Shammai right. on college campuses. So <laughs> Hillel always wins because that's, you know, we're Hillel Jews. What Hillel's saying essentially is there has to be a path toward a different kind of future. There has to be a path toward reconciliation. And so even though the stricter justice is Shammai, you mm -hmm. stole my beam, I need it back. In fact, over the course of time, that beam is no longer just a beam. Now it's a beautiful home. So instead of tearing down, let's build up, but let's build up honestly and truthfully. And the only way we can do that is actually telling the truth about the beam, not pretending that this beam was mine all along and not pretending that the beam doesn't exist, but telling the truth about it, which gives us both the opportunity, all of us, the opportunity to now live in this home together and to live in a just and fair way. And I did share that story as part of a Rosh Hashanah sermon about reparations years ago. And I wanna tell you that when I gave that sermon, many people were upset and they were like, why are we talking about reparations? That's a radical and impossible idea. It will never happen. And why, why is a rabbi talking about it on Rosh Hashanah? And here we are, like in the course of only a few years, 
reparations is absolutely on the main stage now and thank god and something mm -hmm. things are happening right now and so that's what hillel gave us permission to do if we went with shammai and said no you got to tear the thing down so then what does that mean like where do we move i don't have another right. home you don't have another home no you we think about what would it mean to build a just society here to tell the story of tulsa the way that it's been told in the last week as opposed to the way it was told for a hundred years before that to, and then to actually compensate the people who lost everything in a way that is fair and just and equitable and will and and will like the, the, help help the, the descendants of those who 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 survived that massacre help them know that that history is on their side and that this country is different now than it was before that's what hillel's saying don't give up on the home help the home heal Help us figure out together collectively what we can do to build a different kind of future. Amen. Thank you. And I think that's a great place to leave for now. Uh, until next time, can't wait to hear you preach. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Rabbi. Uh, just an incredible joy. Um, look forward to connecting more in the future.